So welcome to the Economic Research Forum Annual Conference 2022, where one of the plenary speakers is going to be Professor Franklin Allen from the uh, Imperial Business School in London. Franklin's going to be talking about issues around global finance, the financial sector, opportunities of financial technology or fintech, as it's called. So, Franklin, why don't you start off by giving us a sense of um, what the financial sector looks like in the MENA region as a whole? So the financial sector differs according to which countries we're talking about. So the main thing is that there are basically two, two groups of countries. There are the very rich countries like uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, and so on, which are at, uh, among the richest countries in the world in terms of GDP per capita. But then you've also got some countries which are among the poorest in the world, like um, uh, Syria, Iraq, and so on. So uh, uh, in the rich countries, then the financial systems are quite developed in terms of things like digital banking and so on. In the poorer countries, obviously much less so. One unifying theme throughout uh, the region, though, is that the financial systems are mostly bank-based. Stock markets and other financial markets play a, a relatively limited role, even in the richest countries there. You've done lots of work on the great opportunities that fintech seems to offer, all sorts of uh, issues around private uh, initiatives, uh, uh, public authority initiatives like central bank digital currencies. Can you give us a, a, a flavour of how those issues might play out in terms of the Middle East and North Africa region? So I think there are a number of different aspects of fintech which will affect the countries somewhat differently. I think that basic things like credit scoring, for example, which fintech is probably going to do much better than traditional technologies, that will have importance in both the rich countries and the poor countries. So it will improve financial inclusion, both for individuals and firms in, in, in both, both groups. I think there are other things which will improve financial inclusion, particularly for firms in poor countries, but also potentially in the rich countries too. So one of the things that I think is, is really interesting about fintech is the potential of uh, initial coin offerings, so not initial public offerings, but initial coin offerings. If you think about the traditional way that uh, new firms are created and new industries are created in, uh, in the US in particular, but also uh, in various parts of Europe and, and other parts of the world, we have venture capital together with listing on stock markets or buyouts of, from large corporations. What those tend to do is to lock up people's capital for some time. So it's only very rich people or institutions that re regularly invest in, in venture capital. Now, I think ICOs are a very different kind of way of, of uh, financing firms. These, these are done on essentially on the internet. They're done globally. A, a lot of them are designed to get around regulation. Uh, and, but the thing that they give is a lot more liquidity potentially. So it, it opens it up to retail investors in a way that venture capital can't. And that has huge potential, I think, in, as I say, in both groups to help create uh, industries. Uh, some of the other things that are important, obviously, uh, digital banking, um, some of the kinds of things that have been so important in Kenya, like M-Pesa, and Equity Bank, which are ways of improving very poor people's access to finance, has, has a very important role, particularly in the poor countries, but I think it also has an important role in, in the rich countries too. And then we have the issue of central bank dig digital currencies and other kinds of, of digital currencies like Bitcoin. I, I think it's CBDCs that probably have a, a very important role to play there 
in the long run. I don't think that the meaner countries are going to use them in the short run. But I think that the, the innovations that uh, China is introducing in this area with their recent trial of uh, the EU1 at the Beijing Olympic Games, it, it went ahead despite all of the problems about COVID and so on. But it, it shows there's, they have a, a system that works. I, I think as we see the problems from Ukraine war spilling over into the global financial system, many countries, particularly in the MENA region, will want to have connections with, with China, which will be, which currently is, not of course, and will continue to be a major consumer of both oil and gas for a long time to come. And, and we may see that instead of oil and, and gas being denominated in, in dollar when they're sold, that we may see it being done in, in RMB, for example, then having this internationalization of the RMB, which I think the, uh, the EU on will help, will play a role in, in, in the MENA region, given their links to China. So these are some of the few aspects which are very important of, uh, for fintech for, for these countries. And for final question, Franklin, what, what do you think are the, are the main obstacles to, to progress in this area? You, you know, the use of fintechs to promote growth and development and the, uh, you know, the evolution of, of new industries. What, what are the obstacles and, and what might the public authorities be doing to try and uh, encourage greater take up? So I think how countries encourage fintech is going to be an extremely important issue going forward. In Kenya is a very interesting example. The reason that they were able to do such wonderful things with M-Pesa and Equity Bank was that they had an extremely tolerant central bank and regulators, which allowed experiments that turned into being very successful transformations in terms of financial inclusion. So M-Pesa, which is this mobile phone platform for banking, essentially, before M-Pesa uh, took off, in most countries, whenever telephone companies went to the, to the regulators and said, can we do something like this? The regulators said, no, you're not a bank. You can't do this. And so, uh, but the, the Kenyans actually said, well, go ahead and do it. We want you to do it safely. So you need to do these, these things to do, ensure that. But, and then of course it, it took off. And I think, what, what the MENA countries need to do is to understand how to regulate, to promote fintech, but at the same time to ensure safety. So, you know, a country, another country in the developed world, which has done this successfully, is the Bank of England, which is, has these regulatory sandboxes, which is you can do many things as long as they are posing a systemic risk and as long as you're not clearly ripping off consumers. And so what we see in the UK is, is um, very innovative banks like Revolut, for example, which uh, are really changing the banking landscape, providing competition to the big to the big banks. And I think that kind of thing is very important. So the UK has been very successful at that. I think the other places which are very successful are uh, Singapore and Switzerland, and the, these are both places where they're quite tolerant, but again, they, they watch out for consumers and, and try and prevent fraud and so forth. And, um, but they're quite willing to have ICOs and things, and there are whole communities that have grown up uh, in Switzerland, particularly in Zug, but uh, increasingly in Singapore too, which provide finance for these innovative countries, which I think is really important for the MENA region. What we see there is, you know, they have very heavy reliance on oil and gas and other traditional kinds of industries. And what they need is new innovative ones. And I think FinTech has a, has a very important role to play in doing that. Frank Allen, thank you very much. And we look forward to your session at the ERF conference. Thank you, Ramesh.